Oh, I've been at this has been the time of my life to be honest similar to yourself not in the sort of things you've been doing but I definitely think for an athlete or somebody that's sort of followed our routine or path to have this time at home completely um, not worried about that I should be doing something I've been doing my house up I've, I moved in end of July last year to our first house traveled those I didn't do much and now my partner's works, she works in um, schools and stuff, so she's been off and paid. And I, I mean, my stuff's still going relatively well, but it's just been time at home in England and the weather's been lovely and it's, it's been the time of my life, really. I haven't had a break. Or, you know, and I think I speak for most people that nobody's had this kind of break in their lives to relax and chill and, you know, I love living like this. I love how it's affected everybody that now speaks to each other. And yeah. I really, I feel like I've always lived like that myself. And now everyone else has had a chance to chill out and not overwork themselves. So I've just been waking up every day. I don't know what day it is to job on the house, paint a room, do something in the garden, you know, hang out with the cats. It's been, it's been wonderful. And I'm not worried about the future or what will happen. I think that, that you know, you get used to adapting, I think. It's a key word that for people in our world is that you adapt not only when you play sport, but in your career path as well. So I'm not afraid of, you know, my contract's up in August, but I'm sure I'll find the next step, no problem. It's been great. Yeah, have you um, have you been travelling quite a lot previous to that then? Yeah, I travel probably five or six months a year and have done for the last 10 years, you know, following the wind around and the season, off season being in Cape Town for two or three months, which is, um, I'd actually just come back from when this happened. I got back middle of, sort of end of February and then it went sort of into all of this. So, but I'm always here, there and everywhere and don't get that time at home. Almost if I spend a month at home, I start feeling like I should be somewhere, I should be doing something. It's time at home has sometimes felt like downtime, but this has been actual real time I can spend at home. You know, it's been great for my relationship with my partner. And yeah. I do have a lot going on in the UK as well with coaching clinics and I'm quite involved with the industry here. So it's helped me think about that a bit more, but it's just been it's just been nice to have a break of the travelling actually and appreciate where I live and we go on the bikes every day. We're right by the South Downs where we've moved to. So it's just, it's not, I've enjoyed the break off my sport, to be honest. If I'm being completely honest, yeah. I needed a break from it. So you haven't had yeah. the urge to like get on the board or anything at the moment? Not at all. If anything, it's the golf that I'm missing. I'm, I really love golf and I can't <laughs> deal with that. I've got a few mates that were so into it. We, we play a lot of golf. I mean, I miss the kiting, but I have kited for 20 years, you know, like golf's my sort of new passion and it's fun I'm getting better quickly at it and I want to be yeah doing it but the kiting I'm ready to go out on the water now I, I now I've had this break I really want to get back out there but it wasn't straight away like devastating but in the UK we were advised not to go kiting so we had to listen to that and I know that some countries are starting to open back up or did not close originally yeah so when who, who um who got you in the golf <laughs> Uh, my dad, really. I played a bit with my dad when I was up to about 16 before school. He used to take me before high school at like five in the mornings. He worked nights for Securical. He used to drive a van up and down to London from Brighton. Then he would take me with him. And I didn't I think what, what was lovely is I didn't touch it again until 30 because of my kiteboarding. So did you get, life. did you, did, did you have golf alongside kiting at the same time? Or did no. which which one got involved? Which, when did you start kiting? At what age? I started. Yeah, they're good question. So I actually started kiting at seventeen, which is a oh, right. old, old age now. When the kids are eight and seven that are starting, and the current world champion sixteen, and you know it's it just wasn't around the sport. It really got to the UK shores in the year two thousand, and I was born in nineteen eighty five. So. I was always into sports. I always wanted to be a professional football player. I still do want to be a professional. <laughs> I still haven't given up on it. I love football. Football is the basis of, for me, and the way I've been brought in, it is, is all about awareness and how you move and reactions. And football continued on to every other sport I ever was into, which led to windsurfing because we lived near the beach and then naturally kitesurfing. So 
yeah, kite surfing was a bit later in my life, but I did so much of that and then got back into golf and have been able to use all my skills I learned as a kiteboarder, but more so the mental skills that I'd learned in sport and was able to reapply that to golf that I hadn't been able to bring into it when I was a young boy, you know? Like right, okay. That made to my game was massive. So what do you think it was that you learned from kite surfing that you put into something like golf which is clearly a hobby now like it's clearly a hobby yeah. but but what is the because it is such a mental game golf like i play golf and it yeah. is it is uh there's there is no other sport like it essentially because it's just you you v you and um yeah, yeah you, it is you, you are your own worst enemy um you'll beat yourself mm-hmm. up you can be your best coach you can be your worst coach what was the mental thing that you you think you brought from your kite surfing oh, your golf this so much okay maybe not just all from my kite but i suppose from my kiteboarding experiences in events and competing and that sort of thing but even just my life experience i was able to bring into it as 30 plus year old you know when you're 15 and 16 you know, or i was even younger than that when i first played and all you want to do is i guess to put it simply all you want to do is go at the flag rather than play sideways yeah <laughs> <That's> probably <laughs> you know and then you learn to manage the course like that to let you know to let it go when things go bad and that sort of thing yeah. you know, i've got friends that are you know incredible kite boarders that, that are so used to things going their way that sometimes when they don't they find it hard on the golf course you know mm. like i guess so many different things i've learned about how to apply myself to golf and the great thing is that you still learn that's what i like about it yeah when when you um like when you're taking up kite board uh kite surfing because i remember i've heard you speak obviously at one of my brother's events and that's how i got to learn about it. but actually that day i remember learning about the amount of kite surfing that there is like the different types mm. of boards you can do the types of events yeah. that can happen um obviously your stuff is more aerial and much more big air, big air like big mm-hmm. height and getting some serious distance um you spoke about the uh, pier jump being the big like uh, trajectory of your career almost a, a point that was ending your career mm. when did what was it that big air that you started in was it did um, you start doing big jumps yeah, and ev- i mean everybody does in kiting this is what it's the most unique aspect of our sport is that it's when i say everybody it's I, i'd go as far as saying 95 percent of your participants start kiteboarding you learn to get on your board you don't just start on a race board, for example. They're quite um, fine arts to learn. The, the basis of how the sport works comes from you starting on a board, which will allow you to jump a square, a rectangular board. You get up and going, and even in your first or second goes by accident, you might find yourself airborne. So the yeah. the kite wants to, unless you're very good at controlling it and you've got experience, it wants to take you in the air if you use it in the right way. So everybody started with this very simple learn to ride along and jump thing so then your career can go off in different directions which mine did the freestyle and the more acrobatics you only have to think of um how they do that in the olympics you know on the floor where yep. they go around doing what's very similar we do wake boarding um influence tricks which is passing the bar behind your back that was my competitive career in my early days when I did the British tour and competed like that and what was wonderful is that the big air came back in a way it sort of resurged itself especially over the last five to seven years where they they sort of got to a point where big air became uncool a bit when I first got into kiteboarding which was devastating I loved it I adapted to the new stuff and then it's come full circle like things do and it's come back to get this real big focus on it because it's just so amazing to watch and I think that's why it's got this new popular thing because the spectators love it and there's events where there's seven eight thousand people watching Cape Town because they don't know what's going on but they know who's going highest and very simply they you know people can grasp that yeah it's entertaining Mm. what what, why did it why did it die off so like if it started if you started with doing big air and then sort of out nowhere it like died off What, what was that what was going on oh, it's just well it's not necessarily that people stopped doing big air when i say it died off a bit it was more that the events weren't supporting the big air discipline they were focusing on freestyle because that was evolving so much you know there was a lot of 
pushed towards these white style tricks and that was the cool thing that young kids were into and then so you know that one of the big events had stopped as well the red bull king of the air stopped for quite a while which was the big event that pushed that sport around the world with the big live stream and stuff that started in hawaii and that stopped running for about eight years or so and then it relaunched again in cape town in 2000 sorry uh, 2013 so it's, you know sometimes it needs this um sort of focus point on it to to get the events back and going again and now everyone who's anyone's practicing big air out on the water as well yeah. but there's like you said there's so many aspects of our sport to do and learn it does keep it refreshing i now want to learn to be a better racer and go around on the hydrofoil boards that's my new goal really that yeah i'm not as good as i'd like to be on it and it's something i can improve on a lot and when i coach people if it's light wind it's a great tool to have to be able to just get one of those boards out and say right let's do a bit of work on that you know there's that side to it as well where you think about what you can coach to yeah so do you feel like you've hit a bit of a um a ceiling with with the big air stuff um if i learned one trick a year i would be over the moon because in 10 years time i'd have 10 new tricks and it's like i don't know if that's how it feels with your sport or everyone's sports but the better you get at something the slower your rate of learning new things naturally becomes i've learned almost everything i feel that i can learn in that area that's a really good point like i i was speaking to um some young guys that i was working with and and i was talking that they're, they're they're so keen when they're young and like i was like i'm sure you were when you're young you're so so keen to just be at the end of your journey you just like, right, I just want to be, I, I want that. I want, let's say I've got 10 skills to learn to, to make me a professional. Uh, mm-hmm. at, I, I want that 10 skills next week. Like I want that. Yeah. But but actually realizing that, and I was describing to him saying like, if you take one of those skills and dedicate just six months to that one skill, you've got it in your, you've got it now in your basket. Like you can put it in your back pocket, you're done. Mm-hmm. Then you go next six months, right? Pick another skill, then work on that one. And then you've actually, you've done so much work on just that one skill. And then, like you said, over, I'm now talking like five years rather than 10, just then you've accumulated a huge amount of skills that you could, you can show someone. And then by the time you've hit like a physical peak, you're hitting when, where all the different elements that add up into making what you would call a rounded athlete or rounded sportsman, Mm -hmm. you've got all of that ready, plus your skill work that you've practiced and you've put in the work and you're away. But it's it's trusting that you've got the time. It's trusting that, and you sh- and you're willing to put in that time that it eventually I, gets you. I agree you. with that. Yeah, I, I really agree with that, and that's a great, um, that's a nice bit of coaching I've learned from you there, actually, because I'm often trying to get quite a few things in my coaching sessions. But that's quite a nice tip for coaching that actually focusing on one part, especially if you're able to split that part out into different. Things. Yeah. that's a very key thing but just going back to the wanting to to learn things there's I definitely you know remember wanting to learn 10 things in a week rather than yeah. in that time and I think the other element is especially when you're a younger person is that it's an addictive feeling as a human to to learn there's nothing but my, the best feeling of my life is when I learned two new tricks this year so I doubled what I would do in a year usually and I was they were the best days of my life that, or weeks that went on for ages, that feeling that I was able to put myself in a place of something I was generally was a bit scared of learning and learnt it. And, and I was, that kept me going for the, the rest of the day, it didn't matter what had happened. So when you, when you got that feeling kind of on tap, when you're a young sportsman and you recognize that you're picking things up quickly, you know, I could learn 10 tricks in a day kiteboarding when I first started. And that's just, it's addictive, you know, you want it. So it's, yeah. I suppose it's hard to slow down and just think, right, let's collect this one. Yeah, well, there's a difference between having 10 tricks and, and then being okay at them and then having two tricks mm. and being awesome at them. Uh, yeah. It's the same same thing with any skill work. Like if I'm looking at a cricket cricketer that's trying to pick up a skill, um, yeah, which let's nail one skill so we've got that or find that let's find the most foundational one first like one that we know that uh, i i was working with a, a a sports psychologist this year a guy called graham winter i did a podcast with him as well and he was fantastic in um he he 
he said to me, or he said to the guys we were working with, um, the last skill you learn is the first skill that falls under pressure, which is brilliant. Like it's so from that, it t- I took it to my yeah. training, which was basically if we're ta- if we're teaching these kids like a foundational skill, they need to f- literally make that like their base of. If we're building a pyramid, that foundational base is so strong because they've repeated that skill over and over and over again. They haven't just learned, like if their competition is on a Saturday, they haven't just learned that skill on a Thursday because okay. Saturday, as soon as they're under pressure, it's going to crumble because it's not got anything mm-hmm. behind it. It's got no it's got no substance behind it. And it Give was me just, an example of a skill like that in your sport. That so if a, oh, a, a, great, a great example would be like a Yorker. Right, so a Yorker is a ball okay. that you would bowl in cricket, which we, as a bowler, you're trying to bowl it at the toes of a batsman, which is a very hard yeah. shot for a batter to play. Like it's it's just regarded as if you're trying to get them to either get them out or or stop them scoring. It's a great ball to bowl, but it's very hard to bowl, and it takes a lot of work. And I see a lot of guys um, from a, an amateur level at the moment, but even professionally, I saw it where they would practice on a Wednesday or Thursday, with the competition being again on a Saturday. And they'd practice it on that Wednesday, Thursday. They might nail it a couple of times. They might get it right. And they leave that practice session feeling good that, yeah, I've, I've got it. And then they go to the game. Then you're adding things like a crowd watching, your cameras, you've got people, you've got anticipation, you've got your own nerves, you've got all this pressure that's suddenly building on top of you. And then that skill, it, it's got no legs to stand on because you haven't built a foundation. You haven't challenged it in training. You've just tried it. Um, yeah. And it would more than often than not, it wouldn't. You'd come off second best because you hadn't, you hadn't had enough time working on it. You hadn't, yeah. you haven't got enough confidence in the work that you deposited in the bank to sit mm-hmm. there and go, well, I deserve for this to go right. Um, this this should go right right now, rather than as soon as the pressure comes on, you'll just surrender mm-hmm. to the feeling of, oh, I know, I I know in my back of my mind, I know I haven't done the right amount of work. So yeah. don't be surprised if it doesn't come off. And yeah, if it, if it ever did come off, it was kind of a bit of luck or maybe some yeah, fluke. Yeah. But but more often than not, it just never would. So um, so I take that into the way I coach and I work with people. And and I was a, similar to what you're saying there. You want to you want to tell people twenty different things in one on mm-hmm. training session. And I kind of get lost a little bit. I'm like, am I saying the right thing? Am, am I giving enough? What, how do you how do you balance like giving enough in a coaching session to giving uh like too much or like too little and where and then yeah. your mind sits in the middle there somewhere kind of tussling with both of them um that's an interesting thing to um think about is the mindset of the coach i think often when you go and get coaching you just think oh well, you know they know all about their sport and they they just talk as if they're not thinking but there's a lot going on in your brain as a coach definitely yeah what you've just said there is something that constant it should be happening I, I think in your head as well am I giving enough am I giving too much am I giving too much is probably the harder one mm. to get in your head I talk all the time on my headsets when I'm talking to my clients I literally don't stop talking and it's sometimes mm. too much I've been told there's time for pause and breaks and it is it is you know it might seem like you're just getting on with it without thinking as a coach but you're really I mean the art of a coach is is the planning of the session and knowing when someone's tired or when they need a break when you need a break there's so much to do a great coaching session that you I mean unless you're speaking to lots of other coaches all the time which I, I actually I don't so much in my sport because there isn't so many around me it's not such a big sport maybe as yours you're not aware is, is that the case with your sport do you speak to other coaches and share ideas and yeah well like that? i think from my point of view coaching for me is especially with cricket um it's one of the things i do it's not everything that i do but it's, it's something i'm very passionate about because everything that i i guess my whole coaching philosophy whether i'm coaching movement breath work meditation or whether it's even the skill based stuff it's all underpinned for me with uh, building confidence within that person in whether it's confidence in their skill, their body, but whether I'm speaking to people, I, one, I look to educate myself constantly. So I look for people of sort of um, 
that are that are good coaches that are that have have coached well in the past they've been good leaders and trying to pick out little bits from them so i read and i listen and and hear how they did things and try to marry up because i also want to have my own way of doing it i also want to have my own philosophies that i bring into the coaching world and the way in which i do it because i don't want to i I don't necessarily want to talk to too many people and get lost in what they do and then lose what I do well. So I know what I do well, which is I I bring my enthusiasm, I bring passion and I bring um, uh, an empathy and and guess definitely compassion towards the the athletes as well as my knowledge, which I then think of is the knowledge is kind of the the last little bolt on that you really is is a good thing to add on because if you don't have that skill set of of being able to communicate and understand and 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 really kind of gauge that person that you're working with um you you don't you don't end up being that good a coach but when i'm speaking we have we'll have assistant coaches that we'll work with and my role like this year and next year is is to create the structure so because i've obviously got you're working with someone that's one-on-one in the water and i will work with one-on-one with a lot of people but when we're in a team environment you need to um, you need to create a a structure of how training works so that if i'm creating the structure and i'm creating the message do i have people below me that are willing to send the same message so right now i'm in a bit of a process because we're in the off season where i'm looking to find those people for next year so we might have lost some people from last year but for me it's really about like the character of the individual the person i'm working yeah. with and the coaches that are going to then um help them spread the message and add as well because like i said i'll take information from anyone um i I believe everyone's opinion is valuable just whether you the information they give and the knowledge they give whether you use it or not that's a completely different thing um because you have to make Mm. sure it's going in the right direction of what you think as a coach is right um yeah when you're working with other people i guess it's beside you so sometimes i do one-to-one but you could turn up and do a day of 10 people or you could do a or session of you know 30 plus of people but the people that are working on your team you would always you know I've had some other coaches work alongside me and I agree that you want them still to maintain their you know who they are and what they do because it has to come across natural as a coach totally, yeah and you can't really but as, you know as long as they've got the same beliefs as you and that you're kind of in line that's that's a nice place to be when you know who those people are around you you don't you just know you're on the same page and that's just probably why you became friends in the first place or why you're in touch anyway is that you just share the same values and beliefs it becomes very easy to work with people like that yeah have have, have you been um have you had a lot of coaching since you've been back in in the uk is, is most of your coaching based in the uk or, or are you actually traveling around doing it um i'd say Probably 60% is in the UK. So what we'll do on weekends with some of the brands that I'm sponsored by is they'll put on demo days where all the public get to use the equipment for free on a beach somewhere and we react to where the wind is. And then I can go and bring my speaker on the beach and do a, you know, an hour or two of free coaching for people, potentially do a one-to-one with someone there on the, Local beaches around here is where I do my most one-to-ones, but mm. it's not unusual for me to bring my helmets and headsets out to Cape Town. Everywhere I go, I'm ready to coach. Basically, I always have my tools, so I can. I don't need anything because the people I coach have have their equipment. They're intermediate riders. I don't go coach beginners. I coach the, the big air jump stuff. That's not advanced. That's very. Mm. Early. You know, that comes quickly after you learn to kiteboard. But there's so many schools set up really well around the world to provide you your helmets, your wetsuits, the equipment that they're going to smash up on their first days. That there's, and I almost feel it's, I enjoy it more teaching people how to jump. I get to ride yeah. with people. It's a full experience. So I'm, I'm ready to coach wherever. But as far as what I do uh, with my job, I'd say that cutboarding coaching probably represents about 35% of, of what I'm doing, maybe a little bit more, but. Yeah. The coaching aspect I can do anywhere and take it on. Yeah. Do you find um do you find there's like a certain place you prefer coaching in the world or is it? Um it de- it depends actually on what I'm coaching. I think if I'm coaching somebody that wants to get much better at, you know, sort of extreme big air and 
and and jumping high, I would prefer to be in Cape Town. Yeah, okay. Because the Why wind is, that? is stronger and it's, it's the, the warmth of the, the, the air temperature is warmer. Right, and the okay. way that our strong wind works in the UK is very violent. It's, it's um, it, the wind's gusts can be a, a bigger range in between them. When you're teaching someone to do their first kite loops, which I don't always do, it's kind of a, an area where you know you can get hurt when you're quite high up in the sky. As a yeah. coach, I have to be careful that I don't teach in too strong a wind, and I have to make very good decisions on uh, assessing the conditions. You know, is someone likely to get injured in this because you know that in our sport i mean maybe it's the same in yours people turn up they'll push themselves beyond what they're used to because they've got this confidence that you're there especially if you're talking to them in the ear they, they'll they'll go beyond the point where they're actually being safe so there's a lot of that to consider and england is very violent with this strong wind so there's one example for it. yeah i think i think your i think your way of coaching there has a different much different element to something that i'm working with which is you've got a you've got a natural force you have to gauge as well so you're you are having to figure out how mother nature is on that day um Mm. i don't really have to worry about that i i don't i think there's only some scenarios where you could potentially look at people are are getting in danger but you can you can um you can manage that quite quickly uh Mm. yeah wondering if i can imagine it the because there's an adrenaline rush with what you're doing that adrenaline rush can carry on and and get get to people and probably think they're they're pretty invincible pretty quickly so it makes oh, sense yeah de- definitely yeah and it's quite interesting be... where you're where you're positioned yourself in coaching there taking someone from intermediate to almost advanced do you do you not like doing the beginner stuff it, it's not that i don't like doing the beginner stuff it's just the um I guess it's the resources you need to do that in a, in a, I think that one day maybe I'll have my own center and I'll, I'll really want to put all my ideas into how, you know, to, to me, it's the best part of your journey or one of your most magic parts of your kiteboarding journey is the, the introduction to it. And, and you just can't replicate that traveling around on your own. I mean, I can yeah. do all my, I can take those people that are ready to learn the next steps easily, but I love, I actually love spending time in kite centers when I'm away and speaking to people that are on their journeys where they've had their first hour, they've been dragged around by the kite and I watch all of the the coaches on the beach teaching them and because you have to, when you're teaching beginners, you really have, you never can take your eye off them if you let them <laughs> go on their own, you've got to be, most of the time they're hanging on to the back of them, the instructors and they have a job where they, they really, it's like a small child. You cannot let them get your vision. It's the most amazing time that you don't want them to go too far. The winds have to be right. So I do, I do have time for bringing people into the sport. But like I said before, the resources required, of you need every single different type of wetsuit, every right, different okay. type of helmet. You need there so many different kites. It's so easy for me. If someone comes and does a session with me, I don't provide the kites. Got potentially you. i can do if necessary but it's they will have it actually a better off on their own gear anyway because it's what they know so it's the resources and you know my passion being big air etc etc but there, there yeah. are times where where i you know might have a family member or girlfriend want to go that's where i that's the time for me to do that but until i have the perfect setup it's there's, there's better places to be honest with you yeah that's kind of where i sit as well i'm i'm definitely I, I move myself away from the beginner side of things because I I feel my skill set from being professional is is adding that extra bit of value, which is is kind mm-hmm. of like the the for me the game plans, the 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 new tricks and stuff, the tips I can give that are just small little things that are built upon a foundation that they already know, which then allows them to like exponentially grow very quickly. And then you, they go from like you were saying, you see them and their eyes are light up and they have this beginner mindset where they they love it and they soak up and oh my god, look, I got two feet off the ground or like for for us it's like oh my god, I got that one straight or I got that one hit the stumps yeah. or whatever. And then, That's it, and then, isn't it? Beautiful, but then that beginner mindset can come later down the line as well. Like you can introduce a more advanced skill, and then you, you, well, a big challenge as well. Once you've got um, someone who has a pretty good set of skills, 
is to then put them into the beginner mindset again so that they're willing to learn something new, fail at it, but then when it they achieve it, that's like a huge motivation and then they become a little kid again. And uh, and I love doing that myself. Like I love I love I think I I probably to my own uh, to to be honest, I actually didn't have that mindset for probably a few years after I retired, especially I I was I was like I'm I'm where I'm at. I'm I'm going to stay there for a bit and I just felt stagnant and then I mm. actually entered a bit more of a beginner mindset like now nah, I'll try something like completely open up to a limitless possibilities of what can be be done and it's a beautiful place to be like you try new things you understand that things take time and yeah you get new skills it's 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 um sounds it's a, like me and my DIY at home yeah <laughs> <laughs> I was terrified to try some of these things but that mindset that I've had and learned through sport has helped me in all different situations, you know, like you do have to be prepared to to fail, to, to go back at something. But just going back to touching on the coaching there, the, the thing from a business sense, if you really want to put it straight down to business, what keeps my clients coming back is that I feel they've learned something. Not mm. necessarily has to be something like the new trick, but it can be like what you just said. It can be they've learned from a mistake or mm. people and coaching is about learning something. And if you can find that, you know, when you're thinking, are you giving enough? Are you doing something? That's, that's what's going on in my head a lot as a coach. What have they learned? What have they, ta- what have they taken from today? And that's why you, you go for coaching because you want to learn something. Mm. Yeah. As well as pathing, I guess, the way of what you can learn. What, what's next on the agenda what's mm. out there to, for you to reach now that you've achieved this this skill work where's this going yeah yeah um i actually want to talk a, this we haven't mentioned it and i guess it follows you everywhere which is the the peer jump that you done the brighton peer jump okay. obviously because i i've that was the first, I, I saw it when it it first happened so people that listening you jumped over the brighton pier in in the uk and it not only made local news national news but global news as well it was um talk us through why that how that transpired and um and what it did for you after oh it's, it's actually very simple to explain believe it or not it's more that I mean, obviously, I jumped over Worthing Pier with a friend the year before. That's my hometown pier, and that kind of got some some good exposure and coverage. But it was they were never set up for that. But I then saw Brighton Pier is the biggest landmark around here, mm. and from that moment of Worthing Pier, I it was as simple as I wanted to be the first person to do that. I couldn't have lived my life if it wasn't me. Sometimes you get ideas or things in life, especially ones which you really feel that are yours and haven't been done. And there's a burning desire to achieve them. Yeah. And that was that. I could not have lived with myself if I hadn't been the one to do that. I, I had the best skills around to do that. I knew that I was British champion at the time. And I, I you know, I knew how to focus myself, but I, I learned so much from that. that I learned from that for my life. I learned that a hundred percent focus for, a year on something you can achieve anything i surprised myself i didn't even know i was going to do it in the end you know i told myself i would i I talked myself into it basically so how how long were you planning how long were you planning to do it how 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 far out of the jump were you planning pretty much the second i touched down off the worthing pier which was almost exactly a year between but there's it's if there was the same conditions every day i probably would have gone the next week and done it you know right okay plan- as far as planning is concerned you know you don't draw out plans and write pages of plans for a year it's 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 the weather forecasting to, you know yeah, that's what you're, that's, uh... you're looking at. i mean I, i've walked up and down the pier i knew i knew, i mean we didn't have as much tools as we have now this was 2009 onwards it was 2010 i jumped the pier but the planning obviously took place between that but I had, a, you know, I was using Google Earth to, I knew the width of the pier. I'd walked the width of the pier. I mean, there's only so much you can do with that, but I knew the exact angle that the pier faced. I knew exactly what wave direction would give me the best launch ramp. I knew what wind direction that I needed to give me the right travel when I jumped. I knew the tide height and I knew the tide sort of ranges I needed. There's, 
there's a lot of variables in kiteboarding and that's I think that's what has always drawn me to kiteboarding is that I'm yeah. a sportsman throughout. My, my dad's a county squash player, so is my mum. My brother was a top 10 table tennis player in the country. I have sports inside me, but this added variable, uncontrollable variable of the wind and the ocean and the weather gave me such open doors of, like any sportsman like yourself, you would love this sport because of this extra dimension that mm. sport is typically played on a, Similar pit, well, maybe not in cricket. Yeah, it, yeah, it was it is, probably it another is. thing that you learn is the, the pitch changes, but the variables yeah. in kiting change so much that you're never actually riding the same piece of chop ever again. And that's quite magical. So all that planning was more about the weather and the forecast to build up. And then it was about being ready on the day that it looked like it would come together. And not telling anyone was a challenge to keep that secret. The, yeah. To me, that was difficult, you know. But you had a mate who was filming it at the time and you go, right, we're going to go do this. I had, that, that I had someone out of kiteboarding, a friend's brother that didn't know kiteboarding, which is great. So I said, look, I'll be doing that. Keep it to yourself, you know. And, and then I had a, a very good mate who also wasn't a kiteboarder. That helped me keep it outside there. Very occasionally someone would ask me about it that got wind, I might be doing it and would tell me how dangerous it would be and I'd kill myself and I had to <laughs> walk away from the conversations. I really had to be that positively thinking I couldn't engage any, there was no, that, that wasn't going to happen, you know, like when you have to think positively about things, you can't so you, even in, in, engage talking like that. So do you think that if you'd told more people, one, it would have got out, but also two, do you think people would have talked you out of it? Um, no, I, d I don't worry that they would have talked me out of it. I would have worried that it would have become... Um, possibly someone else could have done it. Yeah, but okay, more, yeah. more than anything, actually, what I would, what, what I deeply believe is that it wouldn't, have, it wouldn't have been mine. It would have been, it wouldn't have been about me and my challenge if I'd mm. have opened it up to be that. I mean, I've had offers since then with you know brands like Pepsi and all sorts to do something big with a kite, right? And I've been to London and sat there and brainstormed these ideas. And every time I walked out of one of those meetings, I thought this isn't natural to mm. be doing this and then I end up thinking negatively about what could happen because there's, there's you're doing it for money you know like there's there's a balance if people often say oh you, you know you didn't you didn't make money out of that jump because I didn't brand it or advertise it I've made a whole life out of that jump you know, indirectly about yeah. getting some money and I actually believe it was the people saw they see through this stuff people saw that I did that as a natural personal challenge and that's why it went so well and did well because it was as simple as that. You're just doing it for the love of it, which is Yeah, but there's, beautiful. you know, I still, now I'm working with young kids and some of them are really good and, you know, it's a difficult conversation to go into a school of a thousand people and talk to high school kids and say, don't do this at home, but here's what I did that yeah. made my career. You, it's a very difficult thing that you can't tell anyone what to do in life, but you can advise on the safety and that sort of thing, but... Would I do something like that now? I don't know. I'm 35 now and I've got a, a lovely partner and two cats and responsibilities in a house. And it's, I, had no, I had nothing to lose back then. It was a different world. Yeah, that's um, there's, there's so much to be kind of said about that really, isn't there? Like doing it for the love of doing it rather than it being tainted with anything that was kind of... Because your, your your sport, any sort of like extreme sport, I guess a water sport is, is hugely branded. Like it's, it is all brands mm. and, and that's it's a branded world. So yeah, you could have easily done something to be branded. I guess Red Bull's like the biggest example of someone who is doing... They're, they're doing things that are crazily, yeah. uh, crazy extreme and, and they're all branded up because of it. And part of you kind of wonders, well, are they doing it for the passion or are they doing it for the money? Like which one, which side of it? Of the coin, yeah, is it? It's a, diff um, it's a very difficult balance to to get that right. I know kiteboarders that are sponsored by Red Bull that have got that balance right, where Red Bull is simply an entity. I think that's the perfect world: is that you're doing things naturally and people jump on the back of it. When you start to really go to town and how you can make it fit with them, especially that way around, it becomes, mm. I think, a distraction. That's probably the best word. I didn't want anything to be a distraction. I wanted it to be all about me and my mind and my mindset and the mental skills I learned from that have carried me through many situations in my life. 
so when you're when you're on a whether it's like the peer jump or whether it's a big jump that you are doing anyway when you, you're talking about being in the right mindset what is the right mindset for a kite surfer that is going to hit a huge jump and and trying to get like what's the the highest you're going because i know you have a device that tracks your height and things like that what's the normal the height? highest jump you would you could push a 30 meter jump on a big one wow. you know, i'm not exactly sure what that is in feet you might have to look yeah. at that in, but it's quite you know when you ever you see a kite in the sky they're usually around 20 to 22 meters up Wow. So you're looking at one and a half the height of your kite. And, you know, you wouldn't, when you compare that to diving boards, which are five, even a 10 meter diving board's a big one, you know, like, you, mm. but, but what you said there about what your mindset is, it's basically that everything's going to be fine. And you're, you know, you're, you can't go out on the water and be thinking that you're not, you've got injuries or you're not feeling good. You've got to be very confident because the, the environment you're in is actually, um, it naturally can be quite a scary environment. If you've ever mm. walked down to the beach on a stormy day, gale force day, and especially in England with sideways rain and black Armageddon clouds, it, the actual atmosphere you have, it wants to provoke you into being a little bit nervous and sort of scared, but you, you learn to change that and, to, and embrace it and to stand there when you set up on the beach. The setting up of your equipment is a major thing that builds you mentally. And you, you feel the wind and you accept what's going on. But the more you do that, the more you can become calm about that. But your typical beginner would be very scared out there when the wind picks up and gets strong. So mentally, you've just got to be a positive, positive have, you know, happy about things and be positive that everything's going to go okay. Yeah, because you're right. That I Obviously, I live sure on the town next to you back in England, but um, and, and I'm up by the beach and it, is really, it does get scary. Um if you're ever by the by the waves, like there's people that have been swept away by the waves down in England, yeah. s- south of England. So, um, like, talk that mindset is really interesting. The accepting of the weather, because that is not an easy thing to accept. Like the fact that you are the first thing you're going to be hitting is a big wave just crashing in on the ocean. You got to get past that. You, I've seen you guys launch before, but like, it, like the crashing out of that wave, like the like you said, that ominous background um how are you is there something that you do is there like a routine that you do within your equipment for preparing you it's kind of like i'm almost likening it to me going out on a pitch and like my thing was i put my shirt on a certain way i like lace my boots and then i i listen to music and whatever and it kind of gets you in that you for me it was always like right i've done my training pre but this is me zoning in for that day taking the distraction out and 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 just kind of prepping everything to fall into place, hopefully. There's well, there's two areas where you would prepare yourself, and one would be for a competition, like you're saying, you had a you know big day ahead, or even just going out on a windy day on your local beach would be the, the numbers go down from 50 people will go out to one or two can handle it when it goes scale. So you have a load of people on the beach watching. There's a big cafe up here where we go out in front of that that makes me feel good that people are actually at least there in case something happened that you know that's what I learned from one of my big accidents I had in my career is that it's Mm. good to be around other people so you you can at least go somewhere where the people are but my build-up for getting motivated to go on the water in super strong days starts from the day before where my equipment's packed in the van nicely my wetsuit's dry then I drive the van that's that's Half of my enjoyment from kiteboarding comes from my van. I have to be honest. I've had it for half my life. Again, there's a great story with that. We'll talk about that another day where that's my first sponsorship. And I've kept this van for forever. And I play my music out of the van and drive to the beach and watch the trees. There's definitely an observation period that you must be really tuned into the elements. Watching every bird fly will tell me the story of the wind and what's happening and and then I'll be ready. But as far as physically on the water, the, the, the one word is trust. And that's complete trust in your ability. Happens in competitions too. You, you might think, oh, how am I going to do this today? The competitions are actually all about being the mental side for me. That, and now I've got older, I put the physical side to it to just, well, I'll be fine. I can trust that. Because you don't know what conditions you're going to get. And you can really go mad on how it's going to be and how I should do things. But 
actually, I barely go out for a practice anymore. The top guys don't need to practice before their competition heats. They just go out two minutes, three minutes before their heat starts and they trust. So it's about trusting your ability and your experiences physically. I was going to ask you about your training. Like what, what, does, a, what does training look like for a kite surfer, um, whether it's physical or skill i guess i guess you obviously you do have to practice the tricks but what would um that's you kind of partly answered it there that the more experienced you are you don't have to train as much but when you aren't in that experienced part and you're just sort of intermediate to expert i guess what does your training what does or did your training look like it's difficult to train on a regular basis in the same conditions, really. That's, you know, it's hard to... Yeah, it's such an interesting... That's why. Yeah, because you can't say, right, I'm going to spend a week trying this move. You might get, it might be four weeks until those conditions come back. Or, yeah. you know, with some of the gale force winds and the tricks I'm used to doing, it's three months since I've done some of them tricks. You know, three months, but it's a trick I consider simple enough and then throw in the added variable that our kit changes every year subtly right. but enough sometimes that you have new equipment so you have a period of time where if, if you go out to cape town king of the air window biggest event in kiteboarding is usually from it's a two or three week window that they can say on any day right the forecast looks great we're doing it tomorrow right your practice for that and training for that competition is getting there two months before the competition window starts. That's how you deal with that. You get your new equipment that you'd get probably in August anyway. You just have to be out on the water. Training in kiteboarding is about being on the water as much as you can. There's, there's not necessarily an easy way to say, I'm going to practice that exact trip this amount of times. Not in big air. There is in other disciplines where you can get lighter wind and more consistent variables, flat water. But in my discipline, you you, you know, it's off the water stuff, perhaps what your question was, but I've learned since being 30 onwards that the gym is helping me be right, fit, okay. stay fit and building my muscles a bit differently. I never did any gym work or anything until I was 30 years old. The sports that I played, got kiteboarding is such a workout, Lewis. Yeah. It's like, it's all these movements, pulling, pushing, and you don't even know you're doing them. There's, there's no other sport I've done where fatigue doesn't cancel out your activity because you have to do it to go around the water. Yeah, so yeah. I learned after 30 that I can help my body by going to the gym off the water. I've always found it funny when you used to say like when, when the, you check the weather forecast and everyone else is running to go inside, like you're running to go outside because a, a crappy day for everyone outside is a brilliant day for you. But that, that um, a lot of what you're saying there speaks of you're taking the opportunity when it comes, like really mm, taking definitely. the opportunity to come. Like, so it's very opportunistic in the way in which you train, you compete as well. Like even from what you were saying about the the peer jump, like you're waiting a year for all those Society. variables to hit the right time and then you go. And then even when you do come back and that next opportunity happens, it's not the same again. It's completely different. Yeah. I think yeah. that, and you even said uh, when we just started talking about adaptability right now in the world we're living in like you you have to be incredibly adaptable to do what you're doing like that is um that's a big part of it but we it's an amazing skill to have because if you're you able to adapt it, yeah. yeah it's so, appl apply so it applicable to everything is is the best now i think now we've spoke a bit more about it and i've realized that equally to go and play golf i want to go tight massively as yeah well. i'm ready for that but that is the magic of kiteboarding is the that today it's not that windy outside i couldn't do it today where yeah. i live i'd have to drive two or three hours to do it at a basic level but that there's a term in our sport where it's if, if it's going around the groups that this is the day of the year coming up that feeling of this is going to be the big the biggest day the big day to me the sea builds with the waves as you know from being in trouble and, the idea of missing it is so painful. If you can't mm. be for any reason that you're injured or being out the country hurts me. I mean, I've at times flown back from places far away to be back for two days to, to, to ride the storm and then go back again. You know, you cannot, you can't describe the pain of missing. Maybe you could actually, if you missed a big cricket game and you was in a cup final and you were injured, you'd understand that pain yeah, yeah. of not being able I've... to take part. 
because yeah. it won't come again. It's exactly that that fit, that moment won't come again. So that can it can be described in other sports, but it's that missing that once off opportunity. Yeah. Yeah, and I and yeah, being injured and missing a, a game or an opportunity because it will never happen again in the way it happened mm. that time. Like you may come yeah. across the same team again in the future, but you they may change the players, it may change venue, it may so you'll never get that opportunity again. Yeah. Like that and and um I actually had that in the start of my career. It was one big learner I had as a as a young player. Um when I first came out to Adelaide actually, and my coach out here I was really big on, um, I, I knew I needed to be physically fit to do my job. I'd been injured when I was younger, but I was coming back out of that injury. I held myself back so many times because um, I wanted everything to be like perfect. I wanted I wanted my body to feel right. I wanted. To be, I just felt like, no, my skills aren't there yet. I just want to be able to play. And he was like, you will never learn unless you throw yourself at the opportunity that's in front of you. And like this game, we're playing a practice match. You, you, there's barely any consequence on it. The only, only thing that you can get out of this is if you learn, if you do badly, you will learn. If you do well, you will learn. And like from that, it just clicked. And then I changed my mentality of of just throwing myself at an opportunity, whether it was inside I was kind of like not right on the day or just didn't feel off it. But I was like, this opportunity will never present itself yeah. ever again in the format that it's in. So I need to take it. Like I just need to say yes to it. And um, and that then transpired into so much more development for me, like just not only skill wise, but my mentality changed towards everything. And and then I was able to actually transfer it outside of outside of sport and into loads of different things where you just say, yep, yeah, I'll, I'll give it a go because the worst case scenario is I'm exactly where I am right now. Yeah, um, and and I've learned, yeah, and I've learned that that's okay too. Yeah, but saying yes, saying yes. There's, um, there are all these little tips you learn. Of other people as well. I remember a guy encouraging me to say yes more. Simply that. He was like, so you're saying yes to things. And it, yeah, that is it. And saying yes to embracing a new opportunity. It's so visible with kiteboarding as well that the mm. opportunity is only there for a small period of time. Look, I'm even going to show you this on the camera. If I show you how a forecast looks, for example, which is all in colour, Right, so yeah. Oh, yeah. You've yeah. shown me this before, where it's all just colours it's like, and, it's so, it's, it and the wind gauges. It instantly reacts to you. So the white tells me there's no opportunities today. Right, so okay. So then I know if I scroll here... There's an opportunity. Is, Sunday, Monday is an opportunity there to take. Where do I want to take it? Obviously, I can't take it right now. Yeah. <laughs> but if it was windy, the mindset would be, where can I go? Where's the best place to take the opportunity? Do I want to take that opportunity? Do I want to take the risk? The wind's on the on the edge of it could be epic. And the times you go and take it, nearly always work always work out incredible. The times you don't, and you sit in and think, oh, and you can see you can't escape the weather. You can see the trees going outside. You can't yeah. go over it. And then you get that's the worst time is when someone messages you. You've missed the best day ever. That's that's when you realise I should have said yesterday. Uh, is there um? Is there ever a point where it tips over and you go, this is too dangerous? Oh, difficult for me to... Because you said riding, you, you said like a line that. that was awesome, which was riding the storm, which you are. You are literally riding storms. Mm. And um, there's there a point where you go, this storm's just, this is too, this is too there, dangerous? There hasn't, there hasn't been a point since I think I felt like I, like I really was comfortable in storms over the last five or six years, perhaps when I was getting into the sport years ago, but there's, it would be very difficult for me, basically speaking, for any storm to blow up on the coast here for me not to give it a go. I'd always feel that I, I can manipulate my kite, my kite sizes can get smaller as the wind goes. I haven't pushed the boundaries of what I'm able to go kiting in, which I think typically would be known as around 60 knots of wind, which is, pushing 65, 70 miles per hour of wind. You know, you imagine mm. you're driving along a motorway and the wind particles are going the same speed. That's that's hitting yeah. your kite. That's quite a lot of power. And with all that power, the distances you can go quickly, which is why we can jump so far and high, it, it multiplies and multiplies. And that's that's where the experience comes in, is knowing what can happen to you 30 seconds ahead of where you are. 
that's how you mm. become safe in kiteboarding. And so because I'm quite comfortable with my equipment, I'd always give it a go knowing that I can pop my emergency release before something would happen, right. which would detach me from everything. So you've got that thing where you can give it a go as long as you know. I wouldn't go out there if the wind was going to take me out to sea. I'd come, you know, there's lots of variables you control that you were as safe as you could be, but I find it as a personal challenge difficult to turn down. So does the wind have to go across the shore? or Across it- or on. Yeah, across or on is best for us. Actually, dead on shore can prevent um, uh, pr- can, can provide more trouble than than not because it blows you straight onto the land. Yeah, okay. You have to have yeah. a bit of skill actually getting out and tacking yeah. to get out. But generally, on shore to cross shore is what we want. Offshore wind, it, it what not only is it gusty wind because it passes over the country, the buildings, the town. It also, if there was a problem, would would drift you out to sea. So. There are spots where we kiteboard offshore winds, but they're a bit more controlled. There might be sandbars where there's an area where you won't necessarily blow out, but it will have safety boats. But typically most places in the world is cross to cross onshore, cross winds, and that's it. It's all you need. Not even the sea. You can do it in a lake anywhere. On, yeah. the, on the snow, you just need wind and a kite, and that's it. Yeah. And and you've um, you've had a pretty bad hit before haven't you you had your mm. was it south africa was it yeah. was it that one that put you into a coma that's right i got it wrong in a competition actually um no by no means the biggest jump i've ever done quite a big one in my competition life and i made a, a piloting mistake actually and i fell out of the sky from some 20 meters plus instantly was knocked out drowned effectively but I was still breathing on the beach. I don't remember anything. I woke up in a hospital a week, a week later. Um, and I was, I had all these dreams about what I'd done. And it was a semi-final of the King of the Air. And I've only been in about three or four of them in my career. It was quite, I was doing really well. I beat, actually beat the winner of that in the quarterfinals in the end. He got back through. I was, that, was the, that was my year. Everyone co- likes to remind me. <laughs> and so I, I got to the semi-finals, made a mistake on the first move where I actually got stuck in a very unusual position backwards. It doesn't usually happen in kiteboarding, just like cats land on their feet always. We never come in to land backwards the way that right. equipment works. We always rotate facing on anyway. I got stuck and eventually when I watched the video in hospital, I was furious. It took me a Still haven't fully forgiven myself for that mistake. It was a very basic mistake that I made, and I it caught, you know it really really cost me my life. But it was I still have to tell people that you know they're like oh wow you were so close to death and it, I was like no I had it covered don't worry like <laughs> you know I have to I have to think like that I go I couldn't yeah go again you know like yeah I mean I broke, you have to be con- it doesn't phase me at all that never put me off I recognised it was a uh, uh, you know, recognise what I did wrong, but it did drive home the dangers of my sport. I, I never accepted it was dangerous, but I do now. Yeah, that that's uh, really interesting because you could have easily not wanted to get back on the board and get mm. back on the kite and and just put it to one side. But do you think that was the big part you're telling yourself? Um, it wasn't that bad. It wasn't I had it under control? Um, I am under control. It's just one thing that happened and yeah it was that sort yeah, of more mentality definitely yeah i mean if you were interviewing my partner here she would tell you a full different story of <laughs> having to watch me you know it was horrendous she had to watch me drown at an event which had very poor boat safety at that time i mean luckily yeah. that's a great thing that's come of it is it's all changed now but she watched me lifeless on the beach and all sorts you know it's difficult for her but i'm adamant that i i actually feel there was a variable to that which was wind related that what well, it was it makes it a bit easier it wasn't a hundred percent my fault the accident i feel yeah so I, I felt like it was one of those things and that actually i took it and survived and i you know sometimes i think it's better to have an injury and come out okay than to not have had it depending on the yeah. effects of the injury injury obviously if you can recover well yeah, that's great. But to have it and get through it, and to take—if I take a big crash and bounce out, and oh, I'm okay. Broke my ribs in February. I'm fine now. I'm yeah, glad it happened because I've got stronger and learned from it. That's uh, that's a good point. What what damage did it do to you? 
nothing. Really? Or not. Just wow, just knocked passion. you out. Wow. Just knocked me out so hard on the back of my head that I didn't see the landing. And with our boards, they're kind of like anchors, especially if we're in bindings, which people are less and less using now. They're more using the typical straps that you see that can come out easily. I like to be laced in like a right. snowboarder. And just like a snowboarder uses the term catching an edge. Yeah. The same effect can happen on the ocean if you're traveling forward. Not only was I traveling forward very fast, I was plummeting out the sky. So it kind of had a, a double, double effect. Yeah, jeez. Yeah. Yeah. But no, that... I don't I often forget that even happened. It's funny. You go for a period of time, you're like, oh, life's great and I survived. And I'm going to take every moment of every day and do yeah. this and this. Six months later, I guarantee you just forget about it. It's funny. Yeah, but you're, you're right about having that injury and, and using it. I think um, I think to the injuries that I've had, they were merely ways of me learning and finding out of, of things. And I always say to people, if um, if you do get injured, because you do go through so much of your sport where you feel bulletproof. You feel oh, bulletproof yeah. all the time. You're like, nah, you're I've got, I've got yeah. this under control. Got this. And then it's until you have a career-threatening and almost life-threatening mm. injury for you where you're like, nah, there's there's i'm mortal um there's definitely yeah. more to this as well and but not only that it potentially opens your eyes to something you weren't paying attention to it's always like your body is speaking to you or the the scenarios you get yourself in there they're just little messages that are speaking to you and telling you yeah. just readjust just retack yourself and go that way and 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 that you might have got a new path you might have to go down but you'll get yeah. better for it you'll be better off for it and um it's uh... difficult that feeling of, of that what you say about being bulletproof because you do need that feeling sometimes in some ways that feeling is yeah i couldn't go out there in these storms if i wasn't 100 percent confident i was bulletproof yeah. which is almost you you almost have to lie to yourself yeah. to get yourself to be in that you know to, to put yourself in an environment where you know you can perform at those levels you it's a, it's a difficult balance to get right. I know now at least not to go kiting on my own and go that crazy just in case not myself out. That's yeah, why yeah, from that. yeah. Well, it's a good learner as well. And then, and you have to you have to play with that edge as well, don't you? You can't go out, like in any sport, you can't go out there being tentative. Otherwise, you're going to, if you're trying to execute a skill, like from our end, like if you can't, if, you, if you're holding off that, as soon as you pull a percent off that execution, you're done for. Because the other person yeah. may not, especially when you're coming up like one on one against someone they will not be pulling they will not be pulling back from their skills so or you have to have the mm -hmm. mindset that you know they're not going to be so as soon as you pull back and you you put on the brakes a little bit just to be a little bit more careful you don't but you need to that's where your training and your, your physical training your everything else that's around it has to give you the confidence to go out on game day on training day whenever that you are bulletproof and you have to commit totally. all the time um did it have an effect on your relationships with that that injury and and how you dealt with it because um, seeing you in like a coma is not going to be the easiest thing to deal with mate like that's yeah um, that's, uh, that's <laughs> what... did well just talking about my with my partner like fast tracked us six years that we'd only been together a year i actually had met my partner at the king of the air competition the year before she was doing the catering for an events company i've met her then and then we saw each other a couple of times she's south african over the year and she'd flown here and i'd flown there and then the, the next you know barely been out there long before the event started again so we had not long been together and her family were watching and she had to see that and she you very much know what um someone's about when you go through an experience like that she had to manage all sorts of things that you know the media wanted to chat all the time about how I was and what was going on mm. and she had to speak with my family and she did so much stuff and managed it so well that we would we came out of that like we'd been together for six years or more we'd been together a year it was amazing so that brought us closer and you do start seeing all of the friends and family around you that are close with you and want to fully support you and and that's a wonderful thing that came from that. And I, I, that time in hospital I spent was one of the best times of my life, like no doubt about it, which is a strange thing to say. But, it, it, you know, there was, don't get me wrong, there were some times where I was really in pain. My, my body was fighting against secondary drowning big time. I mean, I felt it. I felt, I felt the challenge of it, actually. There was a real challenge of whether you could cope with the pain of it and whether you wanted to 
come through that. But once that died down a bit, the family visits I had, and well, I had all cards up in the room covering the whole wall from people I'd never met, all support. And I was just like, the overwhelming sense of love was just incredible. It was like, mm. Every time I was in there, I was like, this is amazing. And everyone's like, don't, don't worry, you don't have to work, you don't have to do this, you don't just sit there and eat, similar to like what's going on now. It was completely yeah. unreserved time to just be there and I just could pay attention to it all. Like, I loved it. It's crazy, but I genuinely love being in hospital. <laughs> you don't say the same, no, but yeah. It was so it strengthened you up more than anything. It strengthened everything, which is amazing. Yeah, like I, so I believe that it was worth going through that. All the safety events now is second to none. You know, it was like two other kiteboarders dragged me back. And the power of the waves brought me back. So the safety's gone up. The, right. So it, it was actually, the city actually had an effect needed. on the sport. Someone, someone in general, in most sports or ways of life, someone has to take one for the team for it to shine a spotlight, <laughs> to shine a spotlight on how things, you know, that's, I don't blame the event. I think that's human. This you know, is the way we are. We don't put things in place sometimes until things happen and I'm quite proactive at safety and health. It happened to a good person, you know, like now when everyone crashes, I had a crash in February, February, where a guy was turned up to me in about five seconds he was there and he grabbed me by the arm and dragged me in. I broke my rib. It wasn't on the same scale as knocking myself out. It was a big one, but people are really aware now when someone has a crash in big air to go there and mm. help. And, and I think that injury was a, was a, a factor in that. Yeah. Wow. Um, look, we've chewed up loads of time, mate. And um, I kind of actually That's wanted to great, ask man. you, yeah, I wanted to ask you just before we finish, uh, like why, why did you, why do you do kite surfing? Why do I do kite boarding? It's well, I think we covered a lot of it in that chat and it's the the fact that what is the question why i choose i guess i or? guess what i guess what is it to you what does it mean what does it mean to you when you're up there and flying uh it's meters it's in the, the space. air it's the it's the space and it's the unregulated access to that i can get to an environment where you know there's no one else there you know, mm. how amazing you spend all your life on the land. I think of life as on the land or in the ocean. They're two different lives. And on the land, all right, now everyone can't get right next to each other, but you can yeah. still, you can't find that sort of space unless maybe you went to a field or something like that. Mm. And that, that complete uh, removal of all those elements is just so relaxing, you know, to go, to go out on the ocean is my, is so many things, the meditation, the physical exercise, but it's, it's my break from the world to go kite boarding. It also has brought me into communication with so many amazing people, the community of people that kite. It's provided my lifestyle, my career. Mm. It's, it's kept me, it's kept, it's made me who I am kite boarding, I think. And I love the messages it has, like we spoke about, of taking opportunities and challenges and how I've learned through it. So it's just, I don't know if I could answer that in, yeah, it's, it's, minutes, you know, it's it is. It's question. a really tough one, and I get it sometimes when people ask me what what sport means to me or my my career meant to me. And well, what, do, what does cricket mean to you? I'd like to hear that. Well, for me, I always it. I think it always changed in different parts. It definitely mm -hmm. changed throughout the years. Like, and I, I got tainted, but it can get very easy that your why of what you do can be tainted when you're, um, sometimes when you're a first year professional, and I think that that was a learner for me was to make sure my why was so strong. And and for me, there were elements of defiance in, in why I do it is because I was originally told I couldn't do it. Um, and then I, and then for me, I did it just because I started to come good at it. It gave me motivation. It was something I was getting better at. And it was something that I was, I had a community around. I felt like I was, mm. I was belonging. And I've, I lost that a long after my, my injury and my, career ending i now regain that and that's really been i think the biggest part of why i do it is because it's the people around it for me especially mm -hmm. playing a bit different than mine being a team sport so my why was more the people around it and i owe i owe a lot of my friendships majority of my friendships in my life due to sport and cricket so as many of the 
the things that changed along the way like yes i was i was motivated as a young boy to to play it because i was enjoying it then it then the motivation became oh, it could be a career and i was really enjoying that pathway but always throughout it i think the thing that stayed so solid was that there were just there was an environment that i belonged in and i was i was a part of something and mm-hmm. and then when you can become a part of a team that is pushing towards a common goal like that is an amazing place whether and I still get that feeling now from being both a player and a coach, like you're working towards something big for p- other people to potentially achieve as well. That means a lot for them. Um, yeah. and, and then also it can mean, it can mean something for you. So yeah, and the, the people. Is def- is def- and the belonging in the people is definitely something I can relate to. And maybe it's worth putting that out there that, uh, as well. You mentioned that it's not such a team sport. My first thought was I had to think about that. And I was like, but it feels like such a team sport and it actually is kiteboarding in it differs from sports such as surfing and windsurfing and sports where you don't you don't need any other human interaction to just go but kiteboarding we do we launch and land each other it's very common yeah. to have a launch and a land so you communicate with somebody else and the team aspect comes from who can see the best forecast and where to go. And, and, and the common goal is to all get a great session. So there is right. that feeling of community and there is a team feeling that I never even considered until you mentioned that, that you don't just go out there and do your own thing. I mean, I mentioned I like the space for me, but you ride right past, past someone a meter away and give them a high five. And there is yeah. a team feeling of victory that you've, you've made a, a victory that you didn't have to pay anything to have a great time apart from getting the gear that's a that's the real reason I love kiteboarding in a nutshell. You don't have to pay to do it. Yeah, yeah, like. yeah. That that's um that's a good, lovely added bonus. I think that's my yeah. bit of advice. I would ever get. Yeah, I would ever give someone that's growing up in their sport, which is um is figure out what your why you do something early on, because then I think when the times that are no doubtedly going to come that are tough, it becomes a little bit easier to ride ride that wave to not be too Excellent. much of a pun <laughs> that's a nice finish <laughs> yeah <laughs> anyway mate look um people can obviously find you at lewiscraffen.com and then um in instagram's the main the best place to find you just lewis craffen kite surfer so. that's correct facebook as well you're somehow. there yeah i'm on there look mate it's been awesome i've absolutely loved talking to you it's been um it's been great to see you and uh no thank you as well lewis always nice to get um some insight to you know another side if you like yeah maybe it's good you share the same name that it's even more <laughs> similar. Like, it's even more of an insight to see your your world so thank you very much no, loved it mate brilliant have a good um have a good rest of the day take care i will do cheers mate right.